The pit represents uh, the Earth, and then all the red stuff around it is the neighboring galaxies, and the stem represents the trajectory. Oh, oh hi. Uh, we're just here at the Spore Party, where we're learning some fascinating evolutionary science, which, as you can see, is uh, pretty good for impressing girls. What you Spore is this... Uh really interesting perspective on all of life. In fact, you're trying to advance life at every stage. You start kind of microbial in the cell stage. Eventually, uh, you get large, move on land in the evolution creature stage. Uh, then once you develop intelligence, you go into the tribal stage, and you start developing kind of the personality of your tribe. And then eventually it brings you to the civ stage, where technology starts getting higher. They start building cities, vehicles, ships, airplanes. And then the last phase is space, where for the first time you leave your home planet, and then you can actually go out through this huge galaxy where every world is unique and it's populated with stuff that other players have created while they were playing the game. We knew that our, our players, given the right tools, would put out tremendous amounts of creativity. And we'd seen that with The Sims before using kind of much lower power tools. And so one of the first things we did on Spore was spend a lot of time working on these tool sets so that in 20 clicks a player could basically replicate what a Pixar artist might spend weeks making. Now once we had those, uh, we also made sure the content was very compressible. So when a player makes something, it compresses down to about 20K, even though when it's in memory on your computer, it's about three meg running around the world. So that means we could send this stuff up to the net, to a database, very easily, very low friction, and then populate everybody else's world with this creative output. So we basically were outsourcing most of the creativity of filling out these millions of unique worlds to the players. You just never know what's going to pop in your world. And you know, sometimes it's Care Bears and Klingons, and other times it's real Earth animals. We uh, had people draw pictures of creatures before we ever made the editor, just to look at the drawings that they made. What sort of things did they put on these creatures? How did they think about them? This is the cr creature I made, mm -hmm. which is in fact a creature which reflects my own conclusions about what might be very common variations on humans on other planets. I call it super sapiens, because what it is is a homo sapiens. We are, our species is homo sapiens, but one that's actually improved. There are a lot of things about us which aren't perfect. We only have two arms. We better to have four. An eye in the back of the head would be helpful, and we just wonder why evolution did not produce that. We found that most people, uh, right off the bat, wanted something bilaterally symmetrical. Uh, and there seem to be very good reasons, if you're moving on land, to have something bilaterally symmetrical. Uh, on the parts, you know, we wanted to have a lot of diversity for the type of life cycles these creatures might uh, live. Some of them might be small and stealthy, other ones large and powerful, other ones are very social. Uh, so the parts that you use on your creature kind of reflect these different strategies. But actually what you do in the game, you know, if I go and attack things or I'm friendly, will impact my attributes. So we look at two different things here. We look at how you build your creature, the parts that you use, but then we look at how you behave in the world. And your behavior in every level is actually setting what eventually becomes your cultural personality. Uh, you might be an herbivore that's a predator, that's uh, industrious or whatever, depending on how you play the first three phases. So even up you know, to Civ, Tribe, whatever, you're going to have superpowers based upon the fact that you're, let's say, an herbivore. Uh, so these early, early decisions actually still have consequence all the way through the game. And we wanted players to have an interesting kind of backstory to their creature. Like the Vulcans in Star Trek are this very logical, peaceful race, but they started out as this very warlike, aggressive race. And we wanted players to have that kind of schizophrenic backstory uh, with their races in the game. Whenever you make something in the editor, a compressed genome for that thing goes up to our server and enters our database, what we call Sporpedia. You can browse this database actually at Spore.com without even uh, buying the game. And when other people are playing the game, it uses this database to populate their world. Uh, the computer is now controlling the creatures that they've made, but I can click on a creature and find out who made it. I can send them a message on the creature. The creature actually kind of becomes a little uh, trading card in the game. And uh, I can use that creature in a number of different ways. I can also go out to the top level of the game and grab collections of creatures to build a spore cast. And I can subscribe to a spore cast, which brings that theme into my game. I can also put my friends on my buddy list, and anything my friends make while they're playing spore will appear somewhere in my world, and I'll discover them as I'm playing spore. So we have a lot of asynchronous interaction between the players going on, and on the website we'll have reports back from these other worlds as to how your creature's faring on other people's galaxies. Uh, but no two planets are the same. Everyone is unique. Sure. And they are populated with unique stuff. And the only way we can do this is by having millions of players basically you know, creatively building this world collectively as they play. I think what we're trying to do here at a high level is we're trying to find a way to harvest 
the collective creativity of millions of people and then distill it down and concentrate it. Uh, and I think that's, you know, we found that computers are okay at like artificial intelligence, but what they're really good at is they're good at harvesting human intelligence. If you look at something like Google, really, you know, what gives the intelligence to Google search results are all the other people putting links in to web pages and Google just harvesting that intelligence. So we found that computers are very good at harvesting human intelligence and redistributing it, much more so than recreating human intelligence. With Spore, we're doing the same thing with creativity. We're trying to find a way to harvest the creativity of all these players, distill it down, and then redistribute it to make the game more interesting to everybody else.